Sunday of daylight savings time for those of us in the United States or for most of us in the United States. It's good to have you all back today. Um, spring is starting down here and um, Aurora season is getting pretty much over, at least watching the Aurora season is getting pretty much over. But Daniel Perry is going to be telling us a few things about a recent trip he took last October. And um, I've taken trips to see Aurora's too. And I got to tell you, it's exciting and you can get a tour and go with the tour and all that other stuff. But basically, if you're in Fairbanks and and um, the, those places up through there, um, you can rent a hotel, rent a car, have a great time just watching the Aurora and wherever you want to go. There are some things to learn and Danny's going to be telling us a little bit about that kind of stuff today. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen so I can show you a few things that uh, we're going to be doing in the upcoming future. Um, boink, boink. And the first place we're going to go is TAIC Home. And um, you'll see that website's pretty much the same, but it says for gorgeous galaxies, click on TAIC shots. Now, this is a new page, a new section of our website that we just started or just last week, I guess. And when you get there, you'll see that Gorgeous Galaxies is the next slideshow we're going to be doing. This this page will eventually hold all of these programs that we're, we're making up. Remember Comet Neowise we did uh, last when, when Neowise, when one of the Neowises came through not too long ago. And Orion Time, which was just uh, over the last couple of weeks. Uh, the rules for the same uh, are the same, pretty much. Uh, any galaxy or galaxy, because that's our theme this time, and movie or still, meaning it can be motion or not. But we're talking like 15-second movies. Don't send in a two-and-a-half, five-minute movie and say, here's my my entry for Gorgeous Galaxies. We're talking, you know, maybe a GIF shot, something with action in it. Although galaxies don't usually have a lot of action, but you know what I mean. Um it's got to be this apparition, which for a galaxy means any time over the last uh, year between June 30th of last year, June 30th of this year. Um, and a JPEG or a PNG, um, or at least 100, 10, 100, at least 1,080 pixels on one side. And that's the scale. You know, that's just make it big enough so that we can actually see it and it doesn't break down. Uh, color, monochrome, doesn't matter. Uh, you can send me a link to the movie, and uh, if it's if it's uh, longer than that, if it doesn't fit in the file, easily trans, uh, transmittable by email. Um, include your name, email, equipment, and comments by clicking below. Hey, get this sucker out of there. Click here to submit the file, and your, your email uh, program will start up. And once you've got your email program running, uh, you just tell you attach your file, tell us what you took the picture of, and all that other stuff. As I said, you can just go back and see our other slideshow efforts. And mm, sometime in mid July or so, right here, we'll have a third one called Gorgeous Galaxies. You'll notice that there's also a section here called Help Wanted. We can make these slideshows by ourselves. Eric volunteered to do it. Molly volunteered to do it. I, I've done the first two. So, yeah, we can do it all by ourselves. But if we do, all we've got is a slideshow. One of the things that we really want to get out of this is identify some people that want to help us continue what we do with the Astro Imaging Channel. Um, it's not exactly hard work, all the stuff we do, um, but we would like to have more people helping. Uh, there'll be times where somebody wants to go camping and they won't be here to help with the show. We need other people to come on in and help with the show. And by volunteering and things like this, you can take a lot of that load off and you can help out with a lot of that kind of stuff. Okay, let's get back to the calendar. And tonight, as you know, we've got Danny Perry. And next week, Tim Hutchison's going to be here. Now, Tim's got himself a backyard observatory. Hey, Tim, you're out there, aren't you? You want yeah, to hear Alex? What tell us what are you going to tell us about next week? Well, I live in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and I get about a hundred cloud-free nights a year, which isn't a whole heck of a lot. And uh, so, in order to maximize any shooting opportunities that I might get, I took on a project to build an observatory and completely automate it. Now I have the thing running to the point that I do absolutely nothing on a daily basis. I enter targets that I want to see and how I want them shot, and uh, the software that I'm using selects the target to shoot at any particular time. Uh, and shoots it. If I get an hour's uh, clear sky in, in uh, an evening, it 
hour. And, and uh, I was talking with Tolga about it and he said it was pretty interesting and thought it might be worth uh, talking to the folks about in the, in the channel. So that's what we're going to oh. be discussing. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much. So everybody come on back next week and hear Tim tell us about that kind of stuff. And I think we'll really enjoy it. Okay. Uh, where was I? I was not there. Well, I can be here now because I can go back to the other stuff later. You'll notice that we've got the, the comments come section coming over here. And you guys, as usual, are treating it as your weekly um, astroimaging meeting of your little club, your little family, your little buddies. Hey, how's it going? How's the weather? How do you like that daylight savings time? I'm actually not reading any of these things, but I'm sure that's what it says. Um, there's a place to ask questions. If you're going to ask a question, we'd appreciate it if you could put in a, a big red question mark. Um, so we can, we notice it's a question and not just, um, you know, the trivia that we discuss day in and day out over there. Um, and there's some other things to do. Be sure to like the presentation. If we like the presentation, you can subscribe. You can come on down here and, uh, and buy yourself some t-shirts and stuff like that. That's kind of cool. We've actually sold a couple of t-shirts so that we know that there are some people wandering around out there with a TAIC logo t-shirt and sweatshirt. I think we've sold a sweatshirt and a t-shirt. So um, that's another cool thing you can do. Now that's all that and where we're we? back to the calendar. Uh, we've got, we're doing pretty well on the calendar. We've got a little heavy on building observatories for a while. Graham Hay is going to come back. He's going to tell us about 3D printing. You know, there's an awful lot of parts and stuff like that that you need to make for this. And that's going to be kind of cool, a little bit different. Um, and we've got some some a history of astrophotography and particularly women in astrophotography. Uh, Curtis Mattioni is going to tell us about power away from home and uh, another um, next dome, uh, another observatory building program coming up June 13th. So we've got a blank on May 30th. We hope to fill that. We want you to hit the contact button and say, hey, my name is first and last. Here's my email address. And I would like to do a show about such and so. I know you hear me say this every week, and I really think it's important to realize that it's not just Molly and Eric and me and Terry and, and Wanda and, you know, um, I guess I got them all, Toga. And um, is that, it's that we're not the Astro Imaging Channel. You guys are the Astro Imaging Channel, the whole family out there, the whole bunch of you guys. You guys need to do some presentations now and then. Um, I'm really pleased that some of the people that we've got coming up um, are, in fact, um, they're they're volunteering to do some of these things. Um, this, uh, maybe three or four of these people, we didn't ask. They contacted us and said that, hey, count me in. I'm going to help out, make sure that this Astro Imaging Channel thing keeps going. Okay, I think that's about it from my perspective, and I think it's about time we got back to talking about um, uh, going up to Alaska. Danny, you ready to take us up to Alaska? I'm ready. Let me just start this up. I think Danny hit the wrong button. Well, that's a surprise. There he goes. I'm not hearing Danny. Um, yeah, it looks like uh, Danny uh, his it looks like his his uh, he's muted and his video is off. He he might have. Oh, that's weird. It, says that he's it looks like he it looks like he dropped out. Yeah, it, it, he might he might be in the process of of dropping out. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, but I, I hope I, he'll be back here soon. <laughs> okay, um, for those of you who don't quite understand what all happens with this, oh, we have, we we start off with the Google's. Hey, Danny, you back? I'm back. I don't know what happened there. Sorry about that. <laughs> I, I, I think you hit the quit button. Um, um, hi. Anyway, Danny's <laughs> going to take us to Alaska. Danny, are you ready? To, we rehearsed, we rehearsed, we rehearsed, and not take it, Let's Danny. Let's try this again. All right. I think I got it working now. Can you everybody hear me? Yeah, we're hearing you good. All right. Yeah. You can see the screen. 
I can't know you're not we're seeing you presenting your you know, PowerPoint yet. It's like we didn't uh, rehearse this or something. Yeah. <laughs> Hold on. Yeah, sometimes when you drop out, it kind of gets stuck. So you might have to like hit stop yeah. and start again. Okay. Yeah. And All right. Now now we see it. Full screen. Now we're there. Now we're there. Boom. Chasing the Aurora Borealis. Okay. All right. Thank you, Alex. <laughs> Sorry about that little snafu. Um, so I've been in astrophotography for a while. I've kind of run the gamut from, you know, trying my hand at uh, lunar and planetary imaging to deep sky to just kind of the landscape Milky Way and uh, other kind of night shots. Uh, only recently have I started doing any Aurora and it's just kind of happenstance, really. I didn't really set out to start chasing the Aurora or, or make a big thing out of it. I just had a trip uh, planned to Iceland, actually. Some of that will be included here. And it was the right time of year and the right location, so I figured I might as well make plans to try and capture it. And it worked out um, weather-wise and, and in time of year and everything worked out, and I was able to capture it. And it's one of those things, kind of like a total solar eclipse. Once you see it, you, you do kind of get hooked a little bit. Um, so shortly after that trip, I did take a, another trip to Alaska to the Fairbanks area. And that one I actually did kind of with the goal of, of seeing the aurora. But I think what's important with um, kind of chasing the aurora is, and I think Alex would agree, it's kind of like solar eclipses as well. I don't really plan my trips around those events, but if something's going to happen where the timing works out and something's going to be visible from that location where you're doing other things during the day and taking insights and stuff like that, you know, might as well go ahead and plan for it because it, it might just work out. So I did have three kind of main areas that I wanted to go over. You can see on the screen there, uh, one is organizing your travel and all the things that go along with that, not so much uh, luggage and things like that, but where are you going and, and what's the weather going to be like? Is it the right time of year? Um, historically, is the weather good in that area to view this kind of thing, those kinds of issues to, to discuss? Uh, then I will talk just uh, briefly about the actual gear you will need uh, at kind of a basic level, and then actually doing the shooting and some of the settings that you'll need, uh, things like that. So why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, so the first thing about organizing your travel, obviously, is location. Uh, if you're going to uh, Florida, you probably don't want to make any plans to try and see the aurora. It's not going to happen. Uh, but on the other hand, if you're going to some locations within, you know, fairly close to the Arctic Circle, maybe between 60 and 70 degrees north latitude, um, you might want to start thinking about it. Um, the geomagnetic magnetic latitude and the physical latitude are not the same, but they kind of co uh, coincide. You generally want to be at about 55 degrees or higher uh, north latitude uh, for geomagnetic latitude. Uh, you'll see on this map here, this illustration that you know these are your actual latitude lines uh, or indications here on the sides. But if you look at the uh, geomagnetic latitudes, they do you know have a little bit of fluctuation and curve and don't always associate or line up exactly with the uh, uh, the physical latitude. So LA, for example, is at 34 degrees north latitude, but in a geomagnetic sense, it's at 39 degrees north latitude. So just something to keep in mind when you're looking at forecasts and trying to get some information about where to go and what's where are some good spots. Uh, just as far as convenience and places that most people go um, for trips, Alaska and parts of northern Canada, Yukon and Northwest Territories, Iceland, of course, uh, Northern Europe, Scandinavia, those are all great targets or great places to go um, and hope to look, uh, see the aurora as long as you're not going in the summertime. And the thing again is with the summertime, it's not a matter of uh, aurora activity being less, it's just you have less uh, nighttime and it doesn't get dark enough once you're in the dead of winter uh, to actually see the aurora. So you do want to um, avoid summer altogether if the aurora are part of your travel goals. Um, and it, you, you do get into shoulder months, just like with uh, a lot of different locations. There are prime times to go, and there are not so good times. And then there's kind of these in-between times. Um, for the aurora in the northern latitudes, April and September fall within those shoulder months, where it's starting to, in April, get a little bit light. It's not getting quite dark enough, especially in late April. Um, September, just the converse of that. So I was fortunate in Iceland in that I was there in um, mid-April 
and it was really getting towards the end of the you know aurora season but i was still able to to see it a lot of things come into play not just uh, time of year and darkness but we'll get into some of that as well um, also you want to look uh, just kind of historically about what is the weather in the area you're going to is it you know say you're going in february is it always cloudy in february you want to kind of keep an eye on that um, and dead of winter it may sound appealing because that's you know it's going to be dark um, you know if you're somewhere for a few days the chances are really good that you're going to see uh, aurora activity at night but you have to keep in mind is it going to be too cold for you to actually be out there and enjoy it um, I was fairly lucky when I went to Alaska in that it was uh, on average in the 20s and 30s, so not terribly cold. Um, but one of the nights where we got some good viewing in, we stayed in the car because it was minus seven uh, Fahrenheit uh, by the time we were actually the aurora activity was picking up, which was around three or four in the morning. Um, and then also, I think what's the one of the most important factors is to keep an eye on the forecast, the actual aurora forecast, not so much the weather forecast, although that's important as well. Um, there are a few different resources you can use for that. Uh, these are kind of specific to um, Alaska in that they're kind of centered on Alaska, but there are similar resources for different parts of the world. Um, the Space Weather Prediction Center, which is a, a NOAA National Weather Service uh, service. It's very good. It gives you uh, what's called the uh, KP forecast which essentially tells you how much disturbance there's going to be in the geomagnetic fields. Uh, the higher that number, it goes from zero to nine. Um, the higher that number, the better chances there will be uh, visible, naked eye visible activity. Of course, then you still do have to worry about uh, the weather and clouds. And if you're around city lights, just like any kind of deep sky uh, viewing uh, moon phase, uh, if it's, again, it varies so much. If it's a really faint light, um, uh, light activity, uh, you know, a little bit of moon might wash it out entirely and you might miss it. Uh, but if you've got really strong activity, you could have a, a quarter or a full moon and still see the aurora very clearly. So it all depends on the specifics of that particular night and that's the particular display. Um, this was actually a shot from one of the webcams in the Fairbanks area. Um, just the other night, I think, uh, yeah, the night of the 12th. Um, so you can see a uh, little bit of ribbon activity. You can see uh, aurora covering most of the sky, and it actually updates every few seconds. So even just in that webcam shot, it's bright enough, A, to show up, but also show the activity and the structure and the fluctuations of it as, as time goes on. So those are some important resources. I was actually checking those uh, days before I actually left for the trip just to get an idea of how things were, were moving and fluctuating and keeping an eye on the webcam versus the KP index forecast, kind of matching them up to see what kind of activity I could expect. And then also checking it as I was actually there in Alaska and then each night. Um, forecasts are only really good and accurate for your specific location in about three hour chunks. They can give you a pretty good indication uh, longer than that, further out than that. Um, but that, that's only gonna forecast solar activity it's not necessarily going to show you the actual amount of activity or brightness level or anything like that at your location. Uh, that information you'll only know a few hours in advance, really. So I did want to talk just a little bit about the gear itself that you'll need. I think it, it kind of depends on what your goals are in terms of shooting. Is it going to be uh, video, or are you just looking for individual still shots? Do you want to do time lapse, that kind of thing? Uh, but most modern cameras, uh, DSLR or mirrorless, are going to do a pretty good job. Um, even some of your uh, more up to date point and shoot cameras are pretty capable. The particular one I'm showing there is the Lumix LX10. It's a few years old now, but it's still quite a capable camera in terms of you know being a point and shoot. Uh, having an aperture, I think going down to 1.4 or something like that. And it's a one inch sensor, so it actually does pretty well for a very, very compact uh, package. Uh, even some smartphones are able to capture the Aurora these days, as long as you've got a way to hold it steady and uh, maybe put it in manual settings. Um, you can do quite a bit with uh, the later cameras, so like the Samsung, uh, what is it, the S10, the S20. Uh, S21 is coming out, those kinds of things, the iPhone 12 and 13. 
maybe the 11, the 10 is a little too old to do much there. Uh, but so the more recent uh, phones, you can actually get some uh, pretty good captures from. Lens, if you do have a camera body of a DSLR or a mirrorless, you want to get a, a wide angle. About as wide as you can go without going fisheye necessarily, unless you want a uh, fisheye, which is uh, absolutely an option. Um, I tend to stick within the 14 to 24 millimeters if you can, just because I use a full frame and finding anything wider than 14 without going fisheye is usually kind of difficult. Um, so I think I settled on a, a 14 millimeter, which is a Rokion cheap lens. I think it's 200 something dollars. Opens up to 2.8, which isn't great, but it's not too bad. Um, but what's even better in terms of aperture is Rokinon's 24 millimeter, which goes down to 1.4. But again, you're narrowing your field again because you are going up in focal length. Uh, and don't forget the tripod. So when I was in Iceland, like I said, that wasn't my main goal to see the Aurora, but I knew it was a possibility, so I did bring the travel tripod. Um, I was with a tour group, not for the Aurora, but just for the whole tour around the island. And a lot of people were also hoping to capture the uh, Aurora, but they were struggling to get uh, <laughs> rocks and find sp spots in the dirt and use the, the hood of the car to try and prop up their cameras. So uh, tripod came in super handy. Um, Alex or Molly, I thought I'd just uh, stop here real quick to see if there's any questions or any discussion right now. I have a question. Go for it. Uh, just now when you were talking about focal lengths, uh, uh, were you using full frame sensors or crop sensors? Yeah, so when I'm generally speaking about full frame sensors, um, yeah. but a crop sensor is fine. You know, just as you know, your field of view is going to be a little smaller. Okay. Uh, there Sorry, was a comment. There was a commentary over on YouTube about light pollution being, or aurora being light pollution for any deep <laughs> sky photography. It is absolutely true. Um, a lot of people in the northern latitudes, if they want to deep sky, it's it can it can ruin their <laughs> their night of imaging. They'll have a a green or a red cast, and even if you're, you know, doing a, a monochrome luminance, it's gonna vastly affect your contrast of the object you're trying to shoot. And and the other half of that is that, uh, and there is no nighttime during the summer. Yeah, and you're, you're kind of screwed that way as well, <laughs> just even if there aren't any aurora. So yeah, you got to get it on both ends. Um, on the times of year when it does get dark, you might uh, get uh, a strong auroral display. And then uh, when you're not going to see the aurora, it's too bright anyway to shoot anything. Mm. Okay. I think that's it, right, Eric? Yeah, that's it. Okay. 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 Um, this slide has a bunch of text on it. I thought we could kind of walk through it a little bit uh, without making it uh, uh, multiple slides. Um, so composition, obviously, is important. Uh, I, I know I've seen a lot of great photos that are just the sky and just aurora. When it's really active and there's a lot of uh, fluctuation in the aurora, that's, that makes a great shot. But when you get kind of a, a less active display or a fainter display, it's kind of nicer to have something in the foreground, um, you know, whatever it, it might be. But then there's also situations if you're in a more urban area, the foreground may not be so exciting. So you kind of have to just play with it and see what's available to you uh, when you're actually shooting. Aperture, of course, you want to have your uh, lens as wide open as you can get it. Um, but again, that's going to depend a little bit because some Aurora displays are really bright and they can overpower the, uh, the sensor really quickly. Um, so you kind of have to play with all the various settings that you would normally use, you know, your aperture, your exposure length, your ISO, hopefully get that settled within the first minute or so because the display does change so quickly. You're, you don't want to be rushing to try and get the camera settings just right. So you want to experiment a little bit as quickly as you can. Um, then settle on something as quickly as you can also. Um, I would always shoot in RAW, just because, uh, as you know, you have more bandwidth to propose processing. Um, lens stabilization, I would leave off if you're just sitting uh, the camera on a tripod and taking stills or doing a time lapse. Uh, otherwise, uh, just something shaking it like a little bit of wind might throw off a frame and make your time lapse, uh, time lapse jump a little bit or something like that. 
But if you are shooting video, if you're doing handheld especially, you might want to keep that on, of course. Uh, if you do have a zoom lens, I would start with the widest angle uh, to begin with. Again, that kind of comes into the area of composition, what you're trying to achieve, what the kind of shot you're trying to get. Um, the time I went out, I wasn't terribly concerned about composition. I was just too excited to be seeing it for the first time. Uh, so I kind of just left the camera on a tripod, got the settings done real quick, and let it just continuously take a series of photos while I enjoyed it visually, uh, which is kind of the same thing I think when it comes for eclipses, you, you want to be sure you're enjoying it visually and not just sitting behind a camera and seeing everything on the LCD screen or through the viewfinder. It's important, I think, to, to view it and take it in as it's actually happening. Um, focus can be difficult, uh, especially if you have not uh, worked with your camera a lot uh, in the dark on faint objects. Um, so that's always something to try and work out uh, beforehand if you can. Uh, any dark night, just see if uh, you're able to focus on a bright star manually. You typically won't be able to use autofocus on a wide lens like that. It's just the the angle of view, uh, the field of view is just too wide for most sensors to uh, to pick on a star and then focus on it accurately. Uh, they're getting better in that regard with uh, more sensitivity. Um, so you might be better off use if you do have a camera with an LCD screen on the back and a live view mode, doing that, zooming in as much as you can, manually setting the focus, uh, and then going from there and making sure that the autofocus, manual focus switch on the lens is turned to manual focus so it doesn't try to uh, shift out of focus on you again later. And if you're not able to do that, I would say use the just the focus infinity, mo uh, fo infinity focus markers on the lens itself. They're usually fairly accurate with the uh, quality lenses. There are a few out there where they can be quite a bit off, so again, it's uh, important to get familiar with your equipment before you actually are out there under the aurora in the dark and it's uh, a fleeting display that might go away in a minute or two. Um, exposure length and ISO, I think I touched on that a little bit. Um, that's all going to vary a lot. Uh, it's going to depend on uh, you know, the speed of your lens. If you've got like a 1.2 or a 1.4, that's going to capture some uh, pretty decent uh, light and color within a second or two, depending on your other settings. Um, if it's a fainter display, you're going to have to take a longer exposure. Um, ISO, if you have that too high, it can easily, uh, you know, blow out or saturate sections. You don't want that or cr create a little too much green. So it's always just kind of uh, experimenting, but experimenting within range. You don't want to start with no knowledge and try and figure it out that night. So you want to have some kind of uh, range to work within. Say you're going to leave it at ISO 1250 and you're going to leave your lens at f2.0 and just work with the exposure length. Um, thing to keep in mind there, though, is that the Aurora does move a lot and it does move quickly. Um, so something that might look really structured and detailed to you visually, you take a five second exposure, it's moved so much, it's kind of, it's blurred and it's still going to be neat, but it might not show the, the structure and a detail you're looking for. Um, I think that covers that slide. Let's go on to the next one. Um, so if you are going to be out there and you plan to shoot all night um, and it's going to be cold, uh, so things that will really come in handy but might be uh, difficult if you're if you're shooting and trying to keep your your luggage light or or low, um, an external power source would be great if you're able to do that. Um, some of the larger, more traditional batteries we're used to using for astrophotography may not fit the bill, uh, but more and more batteries are becoming available that will power cameras. You know, in the seven to eight volt range that are made mostly for DSLR, you know, video shooting where you need a, a constant power supply. Those you can use just as well for still sh shots uh, and they work great. Uh, a remote control camera app, if you're a Canon user, using uh, Canon's Camera Connect is great because uh, you can get your subject framed, uh, get out there with a tripod, and if it's like it was when I was in Fairbanks and it's minus seven out night at outside, uh, you can then back to the car, get some heat, see what the camera's seeing, set all your exposure lengths uh, remotely on your on your phone or mobile device. Um, time lapse is always something to consider. Um, if you're able to, it can be it can make for a pretty interesting video. Um, as long as again you have a, a, a firm platform, a good tripod to start with, and then real time video. Some cameras. We'll pull it off really well, others not so well, uh, but it is something that's really cool if you, if you have the right equipment to do it. 
Um, when I was in uh, Iceland, I didn't quite have the right equipment for it, but I was still able to pull it off with the point and shoot that I showed in a previous slide, uh, the Lumix LX10. Um, it was, the display was bright enough and the camera was, uh, has a wide enough aperture that I was able to capture it, although not, not exactly cleanly without grain and all that kind of stuff, but still made for a pretty impressive video, I thought. Uh, you're going to be better off for that kind of thing with like a, a uh, Sony A7S or some of the uh, larger pixel uh, low light sensors like that. And a wide lens, obviously, in conjunction with that will help greatly. Hey, okay. um, I have a few photos to show, but I thought maybe now I'll take another quick check in, see if there's any comments or questions. There is a question here from uh, uh, Sean from Red Stick Astro. Mm -hmm. um, you find that you typically need to shoot two images, one for the Aurora and one for the foreground to get two different exposures, or um, is the brightness of the Aurora and the foreground on the same level? It really depends. Um, it also depends on things like uh, just area and amb ambient light that might be from buildings or even from the moon. Uh, if you've got a if you're lucky enough to get a strong auroral display um, that it, the moon isn't bothering it, that can work out to your advantage because uh, the, the moon can be illuminating the landscape fairly well and the aurora display is still bright enough to capture uh, so to do it all at the same time. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of people who do uh, individual exposures, one for the landscape, one for the aurora, but it, they often do it at uh, vastly different times of night and that can be difficult to um, to work out because unlike the Milky Way where you know exactly where it's coming up and the part of it you might want to focus on, you don't really know where the aurora is going to show up. It could only be directly overhead where you don't really have a chance of using or involving any landscape. Uh, or it could be really low on the horizon where you know, your really wide angle camera isn't going to do as well as you hoped it would because you're getting a, a lot of ground, a lot of sky and just a little bit of aurora. That's one situation where a, a longer lens could come in handy, but I think for the vast majority of stuff, you're going to want the wide lens. Um, I wanted to add to that. Uh, what Sean is talking about is a technique that's used by a lot of nightscape photographers. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of what you're doing in Aurora photography seems a lot like nightscape photography. you got the big wide angle and the, trying to get nature or the, the landscape in with the skyscape and things like that. So, yeah, there's a lot if you're a really good uh, 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 nightscape photographer, you're probably going to be doing okay with Aurora. But listen back to what Danny said about the fact that Aurora are moving. And so what you think you're seeing is not necessarily what your camera is capturing because the structure of the Aurora itself is moving along. Yeah. <laughs> and that's really the why it's so important to have a, a good sensitive camera with a wide angle lens, not because the Aurora itself is necessarily really faint, although it can be, you know, it varies, um, but because it moves so much, you want to be able to capture, you know, your shot fairly quickly to really capture that detail, uh, that structure, that kind of curtain effect and those kinds of things. Otherwise, yeah, it just ends up kind of, kind of blurry, which can still be impressive, but it might not end up being the image you thought you were going to capture, like Alex said. All right. Anything else? Good. All right. So let me just uh, show you what I was able to capture. My first trip, you know, somewhat planned, but fairly unplanned and very much a novice uh, capture in the Aurora. Um, so this was in kind of north central Iceland in 2019. And again, this was April, about mid April. So I was really lucky to be able to capture this. Uh, it was getting into summer. Uh, it was still getting dark at night, but when it comes to true astronomical darkness, I think there was only uh, about two hours at that time of year, but it's still dark enough. The, that particular display was bright enough. Um, uh, so I got pretty lucky there. Uh, you can see it kind of the lower right, um, the situation of people without the tripod. They were trying to lean against uh, the tour van and kind of hold their arms steady using their smartphone. Um, and uh, that will that will depend greatly on which phone you have, uh, how well it comes out. If they, I don't know exactly what he had, but uh, if you had the iPhone 12 or 13, you might do a pretty good job. If you had a 
iPhone 6, probably nothing came out. <laughs> um, so here's an interesting example. This was just a single shot, no compositing or anything like that. There was about a quarter moon out, so it illuminated the landscape pretty well um, and then allowed me to capture both uh, the aurora and the, the landscape in just one shot without doing any Photoshop. Uh, the same night, same display, uh, you can see the moon here was, uh, you can't really tell its phase, but it was a quarter moon there. Uh, so pretty bright, um, but still the aurora was uh, bright enough to, to shine through not only a thin layer of clouds, but the, the quarter moon as well. Uh, the city of Akureyri in Iceland is across the fjord right there. That's what those city lights are. And this was probably my best shot from that night. Um, so you could see, even though it was about 10 p.m., there, with the long exposure, I think this one was about six seconds. Um, it almost looks like dusk still, but it was just, it was late at night and there was still a little bit of light on the horizon and it kind of amplified it with the longer exposure. Uh, but the aurora still uh, was plenty bright uh, to come out. And then real quick, so like I was mentioning, uh, I wasn't going there with the intention of shooting video of the Aurora, but I did have a camera that I thought might be capable of it. So I pulled it out hastily and, and tried it. And let me show you the results. It's a little grainy, but it works. So you can really, this is real time. This isn't a time lapse. You can see just how quickly the curtains of light move across the sky. And you can see how, you know, in a two, three, or longer second exposure, that, that kind of detail, that kind of uh, structure is going to get lost and it'll be a, a green or a red blur, which is still pretty neat and impressive, uh, but again, may not be what you're going for. Uh, there was sound in that. I muted it because I think there were many expletives. That was my first time seeing it. <laughs> uh, then the most recent trip, uh, let's see if I can get there. Uh, I was in Alaska, so this is just north of Fairbanks. This is actually at a spot called Clary Summit, which was really well known uh, for anybody in the Fairbanks area to go and try and shoot the Aurora. Uh, but I wasn't really thrilled with the site. It was along a, a fairly well trafficked road, so you're getting quite a bit of headlights. Uh, it was a long uh, kind of offshoot road that went to a lodge, so people were kind of going in and out there. You had the power lines in the foreground, so had nice wide open horizons and it was away from the city. Uh, but not an ideal spot. Um, we did have just a really uh, minimal display that night. It wasn't terribly bright in that particular shot you're seeing there. You could just barely see that visually. Um, if you knew what you were looking for, it was it was fairly obvious. Um, but if you weren't paying real close attention, you could have just looked right past it and thought you were you know imagining some kind of light in the sky. So that was pretty faint. I think that was with the forecast of a KP2. Um, but again, the, for, the aurora for, forecast um, is uh, only a short window. It varies a lot based on your location. You could be a few miles from this and it might look very different or you might not be able to see it at all, just depending on uh, local circumstances, things like that, your horizon, tree levels, stuff like that. Um, so to KP2, I didn't really know what to expect, but it was visible naked eye, but just barely. Um, next night, we had a little better luck. This was a different spot, although uh, car headlights were an issue there as well, as you can tell. Uh, but I actually thought this kind of worked out kind of well, where it opened up the, the surrounding scenery. You could see what actually is going on instead of seeing all those uh, trees just in silhouette. Uh, again, this was probably about a KP2, KP3 forecast, so it wasn't forecast to be terribly strong. Uh, this was definitely visible, naked eye. Um, you could see the green more than the red, obviously, with your naked eye, um, but it was definitely there. And then a little bit later that night, it got a little more structure. You can see a little more detail in it. You start seeing this little curtain effect. Um, and then that one there, it really kind of exploded a little bit later. Um, these are fairly long exposures, though, because it still was kind of faint. And the aurora and the movement, the uh, activity and the movement of it wasn't um, all that high. So I was able to do 20 and 30 second exposures here and it still kind of maintained the, the curtain effect. Whereas if I did an exposure this long for the Iceland show, which was a lot brighter, um, I wouldn't have seen any detail and I probably would have overexposed um, each of the frames. 
And then real quick, I just did a short time lapse of those three segments. Let's see. So that was the first night at Clary Summit. You can kind of see the structure of it really low to the horizon. This is next night. More activity is brighter and moving around more quickly. Did get some headlights in there too. Uh, this was the same night, you know, about 90 degrees the other direction. Uh, at the very beginning of that shot, you can see the Pleiades. So, fun stuff. Uh, and then I just put together. Excuse me, Danny. Danny, yeah. are those shots? Um, yeah. How many frames per second were those? put together um and so i was i was just shooting you know one that's, after re and that's real I, that's real time yeah and then, no and then i rendered it at 30 frames per second okay so is that sped up that's definitely sped up it's a time lapse that's not real time video okay so the uh sped up by a factor of 10 or 20 or 50 or what uh i mean these are 30 second exposures and i played it back at 30 frames per second so okay I, I mean, I'll let someone else do the math. Yeah, <laughs> I'd do the math, except that you know I'm lazy. Uh, but this one, this one was actual live video. Um, like I said, it wasn't the ideal best camera for it. it you can tell it's a little bit grainy. Uh, it's kind of lower resolution, but it was still able to pick it up. There's no time lapse or manipulation there. That's how it actually looked to the camera. And and there's no one speed. Some are faster than others, and they they go at different rates. And right. All that stuff. And generally, the KP index is an indication, I and mean, it is really telling you what the level of magnetic disturbance is in the in the atmosphere. Uh, but generally speaking, the higher the number, it's not only going to be brighter, but it's probably going to be more active as well, because you're getting more uh, fluctuations and disturbance in those magnetic field lines. Uh, Danny, were you further north in Iceland than you were in in Fairbanks? Because it looks like the aurora, the aurora was more towards the horizon. In the Alaska shots, yeah. So that that it really varies, um, you know, each uh, each night um, depends on the activity and you know the the kind of solar weather that's coming in. Uh, I think our latitude, our physical latitudes for each were fairly close, um, about 65, 66 degrees north, because I think in accurate area is about twenty to thirty miles south of the Arctic Circle. And in Alaska, is about uh, 90 miles south of the Arctic Circle, uh, just straight line. So we're and, just coming out of solar minimum. So mm -hmm. once we get back into a, a more active cycle, will this all pick up and the aurora be much more active? Yeah, I mean, I think technically the aurora or the solar minimum was uh, not this last December, but the one before. Um, so I was right at the minimum and still got a really good show in Iceland. It, it really it really varies because even during the minimum you can have you know a, a solar hiccup or a burp and it sends all kinds of stuff our way um, but yeah you're going to find that uh the frequency of it increasing as we reach solar maximum and probably the intensities as well um but eric there's uh, the way you asked that question a little while earlier about um uh it would lower on the horizon because you must have been at a different latitude no actually there, it it might be on one side of you, and then it'll move over to the other side of you. Um, yeah. It it's not as if it's always on the same side or always north of you or always south. It'll right. move around. It's like it's like a cloud. You yeah, know? and on the the night in Iceland, like I said, I was part of a, a tour group, and there were, I think twelve of us, and the aurora kind of slowed down and got fainter, and most people went back inside. I stayed outside, and it picked up again within about 20 to 30 minutes and it was even brighter than the, the first show. And some of them like uh, were directly overhead and those were kind of neat because they looked, you know, very different. It's kind of like look, looking at a curtain face on versus straight down. Uh, straight down you have a more ribbon effect and the light's more intense, um, whereas face on you kind of see the, more of a ripple um, and it's not quite as intense. So let's see, just put together a few links and resources you might want to consider if you are uh, finding yourself either planning an Aurora trip or find, planning a trip where you'll end up um, possibly viewing the Aurora. Um, so the NOAA National Weather Service Space Center Prediction Center, uh, 
shows uh, lots of different graphics in your KP index for, for days out, but you have to keep an eye on that again because it's really only accurate for a few hours at a time, but they do, they can tell you what kind of activity is coming in from the sun. It's just a matter of you know, where it's going to land and where it's going to be in, intense, and that's not known until uh, quite a bit closer to the actual night that you're hoping to view. Uh, lots of nice graphics there as well. Shows you kind of, um, you know, you might think it's a uh, an even circle around uh, the North Pole area where everybody gets a, an equal show, but there's kind of bands where it's thicker and more intense uh, in some areas, uh, say over Fairbanks and uh, same latitude over Russia. It's really uh, thin. And you're not going to see much. Kind of it moves around not only in your local display, but the entire kind of band of intensity moves as well throughout the night. Um, there are obviously areas um, other than the US that you might want to see the aurora. Uh, Europe has a good site uh, for checking out for forecasts there. It's a good uh, mobile app. Um, I like that particular app just because it does show you your actual um, Earth weather as well as the space weather and the KP index, um, kind of using these graphs here as kind of an indication of your likelihood of seeing it. Of course, all this depends though, if you could have a great uh, KP index, uh, you know, it's five or six or seven and no moon and then clouds come in. And just like an eclipse, you're, you're kind of screwed. <laughs> um, so it's best to try and be there for wherever you're gonna be for multiple nights and keep an eye out for it each night. Uh, and then if you're so inclined, uh, I might wanna visit my personal website, which is californiastars.net. And that's all I got. The end. Danny, I want you to share. Um, it looked like you were in a tour group on uh, in Iceland. What were you doing in in Alaska? Were you in a tour group or or no? So the Iceland trip, the tour group was that was just the tour for the island. It wasn't aurora specific. We just happened to be at a place uh, that night where it was clear and uh, the aurora came out. So that worked out perfectly. Um, Alaska was just a, a trip. Um, uh, my girlfriend and I took just no tour planned, anything like that. It was last October, so it was in the middle of uh, COVID travel restrictions. It did require a COVID test three, uh, 72 hours before we departed, but that went off without a hitch. No, no problems there. So um, we, just, we just took an Airbnb in, in uh, just outside Fairbanks. But we actually did have the goal of trying to catch the Aurora. Uh, we also had other, you know, daytime activities planned as well and, and sites to see and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, it should be noted that these people live in the far north. They're perfectly at home. Uh, there's a great big ice festival in uh, Fairbanks every February, I think, where there are ice sculptures all over the place. It's a big street mm -hmm. fair with, with ice sculptures and stuff like that. Uh, you can stay at the Holiday Inn or... I mean, it's just you just land there, rent a car, and drive off to wherever you want to go. There are resorts built um, for both the summer and the winter, where um, they will put you in a. Um, well, first off, you can just by staying at the resort. What was the chain of hot springs? Um, yeah, I think Scandinavian countries have been doing that for a while, where they've got you know glass roof uh, places you can rent and you know bubble rooms and stuff like that. They're entirely see-through. Um, uh, Iceland is just trying to is just kind of starting to get into that area of tourism. You know, their tourism just only took off about ten years ago, um, so they're still developing a lot of their sites and they're developing different areas of tourism. Uh, but yeah, in Alaska, there's Chenna Hot Springs, which we went to. Um, they they have some areas like that as well there. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us about um, your equipment. How do you take care of your equipment from get it keeping it from freezing? <laughs> um, you know, I didn't have any issues whatsoever. Um, my cameras used to being out in the cold, not necessarily that cold. Um, but yeah, that one night when it got down to minus seven, uh, I was out there to set up the tripod, frame uh, my shots, and set it to start taking uh, exposures one after another. Uh, but I sat in the car for <laughs> most of the time after that. Um, but yeah, it held up well. I, I use a Canon 5D Mark IV. And it had no, ran into no, no issues whatsoever. Um, I can tell you stuff about some of my experiences when I was um, at doing this kind of stuff. I'd, I'd um, 
uh, one of the things is you got to watch out if you've been out in that minus 10, 15 degrees, which I was when I was taking pictures of the Aurora, uh, your camera gets so cold and your tripod is so cold that if you take it indoors without proper mm -hmm. protection, what's going to happen is it's just going to suck all the moisture out and you're going to have frost all over the thing and you're not going to be able to use it the rest of the night. Not because it's shot or mechanically hurt. It's just it's covered with ice. Yeah. And wrap it in a plastic bag before you take it inside and allow it to heat up. If yeah, you, you if it's out there in the cold, it'll be fine. It's once you introduce that temperature change where issues can arise. Yeah. Um, I had to use batteries because I wasn't, uh, because I didn't have uh, 110 volt where I was. Yeah. And um, <laughs> So it's important to keep, I mean, you understand, of course, that you've got 16, 18 layers of clothes on. Mm -hmm. And way down underneath all of that, you've got your battery sitting in your T-shirt pocket because your body warmth has to keep that battery warm. So you've got your spare battery sitting in there. And after a certain amount of time, and it's an amazingly long time, believe it or not, that those batteries will last in the cold, um, that one battery will be dead. And so you take it out, put the new one in uh, that has been sitting, you know, in your T-shirt pocket. And oh, then it's really exciting. You put the cold <laughs> battery in the T-shirt pocket. And uh, in an hour or so, the battery you had started with is dead, but you've rejuvenated the one that's in your T-shirt pocket. You've warmed it back up to where it's working again. Uh, so you, you got to start thinking about those kinds of things. Yeah, I, should, I did have the uh, accessory battery grip on the camera, so I have two batteries in there, and that certainly helped. Uh, that let me go for, I think, maybe close to three hours. Uh, with that but going forward next time I, I do this i plan to get an external uh, power supply with one called uh, i think the juice box which is meant mostly for video shooting but you can plug your uh, dslr directly into it as long as you've got your um, your little phony battery your dc converter but you don't need the little box that you usually have it just plugs directly into that almost like a like a phone power bank or something like that um, and those can go multiple nights yeah but you want to keep it warm you want to keep it yeah. Inside the back, inside the uh, parker. Yeah, especially with lifting them on because they, they do get pretty sensitive to cold where uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure it needs to be down to about minus 10 or minus 20, which I was getting close to, uh, but they may eventually just give out on you. Uh, whereas lead acid is going to continue to work. It's just going to, the lifespan of it's going to be shortened a little bit. Okay. Uh, Eric, you got any other questions out there? Any comments? Uh, let me unmute myself. Uh, no, I don't see anything. There's lots of discussions, and I think people are really enjoying your presentation, Danny. Uh, cool. you were, we're, we've all kind of thought, if we haven't done it yet, about getting out there and photographing the Aurora. Yeah, I, I was lucky in that first trip that it all worked out because it's one of those things where I was going just because I was going to go to Iceland regardless. I was going to have a good time. And in the back of my mind, I'm like, I really hope that the conditions come out for the Aurora. And it did that the second night I was there. OK, uh, thank you very much. Um, as we go ahead and put any last minute questions you want to get in there, uh, I want to remind you that um, uh, Danny, could you stop sharing your screen, please? Yes. Uh, yeah, um, that uh, we've got lots of good shows for you coming up. Uh, we have noticed that the 4th of July is a um uh well it's a it's a sunday so we are not going to have the astro imaging channel on the fourth of july but we've got between now and then five or six spots for somebody to volunteer uh we also have um, lots of space for people to um to uh let's see hang on I want to remind you also that uh, on taic shots We've got those gorgeous galaxies, um, and it is time to go ahead and get your pictures of the galaxies in, and we'll be putting together and another big uh, uh, video like this. Okay, uh, if everything is as I suspect it is, are we ready to go, Eric and Molly? Yep. Okay, Danny, thank you very much for being here tonight. We, uh, I think you gave them a lot of good information and you inspired a few people. Honestly, people, all you got to do to do this
is um, is book a flight to Fairbanks and uh, you stay at the, the Holiday Inn and rent a car and take your camera and lots of clothes, lots and lots and lots of clothes. And you can take pictures of that, okay? Thank you very much, everybody. Molly, take us out. All righty. Have a good night, all. Thanks, everyone.